Uh, thank, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, joining uh, today. Uh, we're going to uh, be discussing with uh, Michael Bouvet about the ISFGS consensus in endocrine surgery, and we're going to be talking about um, the near infrared guided surgery use in uh, thyroidectomies, parathyroidectomies, and, and adrenalectomies. So, uh, Michael, thank you very much uh, for participating today. And uh, if you want to start, sure. Okay, can you hear me okay, Fernando? Sure, yeah, perfect. Okay, yeah, it's great to um, see everybody joining the webinar. And as Fernando said, we're gonna talk about uh, a consensus in endocrine surgery for fluorescence imaging, fluorescence guided surgery. And uh, these are gonna be the topics that we'll go through and we wanna try to make it interactive. So uh, Fernando and I'll sort of have a discussion along the way, but if people wanna raise their hands or chat uh, and stop us at any time and ask questions, it's fine. We have about an hour we can use for the uh, topics. And so we'll talk about ICG. We're gonna talk a bit about imaging parathyroid glands because that's a real hot topic now with autofluorescence and also fluorescence. We'll t and we'll talk about uh, adrenal surgery as well. So first of all, ICG, as most of probably everybody's on the phone call or the webinar knows, it's been around for a long time. And it's a near infrared dye that uh, when you excite it at about 800 nanometers wavelength, it emits at 825 or so. And uh, this is, it comes in 10 cc's uh, aqueous solvent and it binds to plasma proteins, of which albumin is the principal carrier. The half-life is uh, 150 to 180 seconds. And um, it has a unique uh, sort of circulation. So when it goes and gets circulated, it's um, exclusively uh, placed by the liver into the bile duct. So that is where we use it for laparoscopic cholecystectomy to identify the biliary anatomy. The toxicity is low, but Anybody who has an allergy to sodium iodide, you should use it very much in caution in those types of patients. So you always wanna ask if they have an allergy to iodine or shellfish. And, and if they do, you probably shouldn't use it. Um, and the history goes back all the way to the 1950s when it was used uh, in Kodak films, actually. And it turned out that there was a doctor at the Mayo Clinic that developed it he got the ICG from the Kodak Eastman company and he used it to measure cardiac output in 1956. So it's been around for a long time. It was approved by the FDA, but now it's mainly used for perfusion assessment. So uh, that's, that's the application for parathyroid surgery. And let's just go through uh, why we would wanna uh, know where our parathyroids are. Well, for a lot of reasons, um, the superior parathyroids are just little, well, parathyroids themselves are very small glands when they're normal size. The superior parathyroids sit above the inferior thyroid artery and they can be, uh, you know, on the gland in a posterior position or in some ectopic locations. And then the lower parathyroids are more in the anterior surface of the gland below the inferior thyroid artery, but they can also be in some ectopic locations. Now, when one of the glands forms uh, a growth, and usually it's a benign growth, you can get primary hyperparathyroidism. Um, and this is usually caused by a single adenoma. Sometimes you can get foregland hyperplasia or occasionally double adenomas. Fortunately, it's rarely a, a cancer, a parathyroid carcinoma. That's very rare. And the presentation that we learn in medical school is either they have no symptoms or they have stones, bones, groans, moans, and psychic overtones. And the stones uh, refer to kidney stones, not gallstones. The bones means osteoporosis and painful res resorption of calcium in the bones. Groans can be peptic ulcer, pancreatitis occasionally. And then in general, people who have hyperparathyroidism just don't feel very well. They get fatigued and muscle aches and they sometimes get depressed and even confused and they can't concentrate as well as they used to. So a lot of these symptoms are sort of subtle and when you fix the problem, people feel like a fog has been lifted. So it's, it can be very gratifying to help these patients. 
Um, we have strategies for successful parathyroidectomy, and I use many of them. We can start with an ultrasound in clinic that we do ourselves, looking for a parathyroid adenoma and also looking for concomitant thyroid disease. 4D CT scan is very useful, I think. MRI, maybe a little less so. And Sestamibi scanning has been around a long time. Some endocrinologists will stick a needle into a parathyroid adenoma and send it for a PTH aspirate to see. Uh, we don't use it too much. Uh, in the old times, we used to use regular angiography and venous sampling and so forth when it, they were very difficult to find parathyroid adenomas, but we don't use that very often anymore. And then intraop, we have intraoperative ultrasound, PTH assay. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, there was a popular a time for the handheld gamma probe uh, to identify these, and now we have ICG angiography to help us as an adjunct in the operating room. This is a typical parathyroid adenoma that we would take out. Uh, this is about a two centimeter gland. And when you send it to the pathologist and they do a frozen section, you'll just see sheets of cells like this uh, with, and if you're lucky, you'll see a little compressed rim of normal parathyroid tissue with about 50% fat. So that's a typical parathyroid adenoma. And this is actually interesting because some recent studies have shown that you can see this normal cap when you're doing autofluorescence. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So uh, the other thing we do, and it's not available at all hospitals, in fact, our own hospital, it, it's called quick PTH, but I call it the slow PTH at our hospital because it takes about a half hour to 40 minutes because we have, a, have to send it downstairs and that's very inconvenient. But uh, the, the dictum is that you should check the PTH level after the patient's intubated, but before you make the incision. And then 10 minutes after you remove the adenoma, the parathyroid hormone level should fall by more than 50%. And if it doesn't, you have to keep searching and looking uh, because there could be either you took out the wrong gland or perhaps there's a second adenoma in there. So quick PTH has been sort of a gold standard for a while to make sure you had a successful parathyroidectomy. So about in 2015, we reported a case report of ICG fluorescence guided redo parathyroidectomy. And this was a patient that I operated on with a large parathyroid adenoma that had been missed by the first surgeon. And uh, we used ICG in that case and, and were able to find it. Uh, we had a nice localizing study, so it wasn't too difficult. And we also uh, put out a video on video endocrinology that same year, uh, kind of demonstrating the technique. So when we first started, we used the pinpoint system. And this was a laparoscope that was made by Novadac that had near infrared fluorescence capability and a color overlay. And it was really designed for uh, looking at colons and looking at perfusion of the colon. And it was used in the pillar two trials. But we tried it in the neck and you can see it's a bit awkward during a parathyroid procedure. However, you can stick it right into the incision and you can get very close to the parathyroid, which is kind of nice because uh, some of the other devices that we have now, uh, you have to have them at least 10 centimeters away from the neck. So, but that's all we really had at, at least at my hospital back in 2015. So we use that. Then we, uh, Stryker came out with this other device called the SpyFi, which was a handheld fluorescence imaging system. And I've got a few pictures of that. And this is something you drape and you can use for open surgery. You can uh, use it on a handle to keep it steady while you're operating. And uh, here's just a little uh, video of us using that device during the surgery. And of course, there's other devices too, and I'll, I'll share some of those with you during the talk. Um, this is just what we have available at our hospital. So let me show you a few cases that we can go through about how we use fluorescence technology during at least hyperparathyroidism. That's what I'll talk about first. So this is a, a 66 year old female who is very tired. She actually had a previous unsuccessful parathyroidectomy at another hospital. She was obese and she had a cervical fusion with limited neck mobility. And you can see sort of all the hardware in the spine there. And BMI was 37, she had high calcium, high PTH, 
the SESTA MIBI showed a possible left lower and the CT scan here, you see uh, maybe a seven millimeter parathyroid adenoma right above the sternal notch. Uh, so we had something to go after and we brought her to the OR, uh, went through the same incision that she had previously and we found right above the sternal notch, we found what we thought was a parathyroid adenoma. We gave some ICG and it just lit up like a light bulb. Um, you can see on this black and white mode, you can see the blood vessel supply, the vascular supply to the parathyroid adenoma there very nicely. And the thyroid is pushed up out of the way, so we have very little background on this video. So it's one of my favorite things to show. But I'll also show you how sometimes it can be a little trickier because you've got the fluorescence from the thyroid. So that was this case. Here was oh, another Mike, <laughs> Mike, in, in order yeah. to let, let me let me interrupt you because I have a, a couple of questions. So sure. <laughs> at the beginning, you, you told us that this is a new technology and that you use IL, a ICG and it has a, a low um, incidence of uh, adverse effects. So uh, when did you start using ICG in your practice? Well, that, that case report came out in, in 2015. So we started, I think we got the, the Novodak pinpoint right at the beginning of 20, maybe 2014 or 2015. So that's so, when I started using it. Yeah. When and my question is because you have, I know that you have a, a huge experience using ICG. So have you seen any adverse effects in all the cases that you did? You know, I, I haven't. Um, I've been lucky, I guess. It's, but I've given it to hundreds of patients now. Um, no allergic reactions. Um, nothing that I could report. Uh, I've been pretty careful about not giving it to anybody with an allergy. I always ask. Um, one time I can say, uh, we, the anesthesiologist mistakenly gave the entire file uh, which was 25 milligrams of ICG, I guess it would be, <laughs> and nothing bad happened. We and, 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 and what about, what about uh, you know, the, the consent? You need to consent the patient to perform this kind of procedure or no? It's a good question, and we've done, we've asked this question on some of our Delphi surveys to all the uh, people that have, you know, participated in that, and I have not been getting consents for it. Um, I, I tell the patients about it, and some patients will ask me also, hey, are you going to use the dye? Uh, some patients, but I haven't been consenting anybody for it. And, and, and when you start, you know, because you know, I, I know that your center is using a lot of ICG. So do you believe that, uh, or do you see that the patient comes more now to your uh, clinic because of the ICG or because of the fluorescence? So it's just an attraction for the hospitals uh, to have this kind of technology? Oh, I think for certain procedures, definitely, yes. People um, are becoming more aware of it with lap coli and, you know, with parathyroid. Patients with hyperparathyroidism and other sort of endocrine disorders tend to go on the internet and they look and they, you know, see what's available. So many of them are very knowledgeable when they come in. So they will oft, quite oftentimes ask about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And my, my last question for now, so, so you can continue is, uh, you're showing us like very, you know, beautiful images of the parathyroid uh, glands adenoma that are glowing there. So uh, when, when do you decide to use this technology? Do you use this for all the cases or you use them you know, for the cases that you kind of localize the adenoma? How does it work in your practice? I've been using it on all of them because you know, we're a teaching institution and I've been very interested in, in gathering data to decide uh, what the pitfalls are and how useful it is. And so we, we publish some of our data and I'll, I'll share that. But I use it on even the easy ones because uh, it just gives me a little extra information about the nature of the gland and whether or not I need to look for other ones, um, whether or not, uh, you know, what the perfusion status is. And so I, I found it pretty helpful. Do I need it? For each case, probably not, but I've just been using it on a routine basis uh, with all my parathyroids anyway. And that's for primary hyperparath. Uh, I think the autofluorescence is really good for 
the normal parathyroids, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Thank you. Good. Yeah, so this is another case, and you can see, I think one of the key points is get good preoperative imaging, and uh, we re I really like the CT scan. You can see this huge adenoma in a posterior position in this patient, and this is actually an area that if you were just exploring the patient without that CAT scan, you might not go deep enough. So this was a large parathyroid adenoma, but it was all the way down by the spine behind the inferior thyroid artery. Uh, we gave the ICG, and I wanted to just show one, point out one thing on this video. So you see the parathyroid adenoma here. You also see some fluorescence in the adjacent thyroid. Now, when you go on the black and white mode, you can see the difference. So the parathyroid fluorescence pattern is very uh, like a sheet of fluorescence, whereas the thyroid has blood vessels on the surface. So you, you can kind of switch in back and forth between the color overlay mode or the black and white mode and make sure you get the whole thing out with the fluorescence. So th that's that case. And you can use your nerve monitor if you're concerned, you know, you, you always want to make sure you've identified the recurrent laryngeal nerve so you don't have that sort of complication. What is interesting to me is that they are glowing more than the other structures. And why is that? Why, why do you believe they are, because the artery is still very small. So what do you believe they are uh, glowing more than, in some cases, even more than the thyroid gland? Yeah, well, it's because the parathyroid has such a, a robust perfusion, really. And, um, and I think that, but perhaps it's even more than that. Maybe it concentrates a little in the parathyroid because when you take it out uh, and put it on the back table, it still glows in the dark. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really a perfusion uh, thing and the parathyroids are just very vascular for the most part. And the other thing is if you, if you crimp off the blood supply to the gland, there's no ICG that gets in there. So that's really what tells me that it's gotta just be a perfusion situation. I'll show you a video of that in a minute. Um, this is a case I just did a few weeks ago, a um, 72-year-old lady who came to my clinic and I do my own ultrasounds and I, I recommend anybody who gets into this business with thyroid and parathyroid, you know, an ultrasound is like an extension of the physical exam. So you, you just get used to it. You, it, I love it. I use it on almost all my head and neck cases. But this, this we could find it right there. It was on the left side. And we did a CT scan also, and sure enough, there was, you know, parathyroid adenoma. And this one, I would say, was very easy. We just opened up the neck, gave the ICG. It lit up within 30 seconds, uh, and just like a, you know, a light bulb. Sometimes these other modes, too, like the CSF mode is nice, or the black and white mode. That gives you a little more contrast there, where you can really see things. Uh, here's another one, and this is, this is a redo case. So this is one I did last week, actually. And this patient had had surgery by another surgeon uh, at our own institution, and that surgeon went in and, and he had, uh, the, the sestomibi was basically the same. This patient, uh, he took out a right upper gland, which was actually hypercellular. And then he took out the left side too. I, I'm not exactly sure why, but there was one normal parathyroid gland in the left thyroid that was sort of intercapsular. And the patient postoperatively, her calcium never went down and her PTH never went down. So we re-imaged her and she still had something on the right lower side. And you could see on the sestamibi there a, a, a bright spot. And then on the CAT scan, you can see a right lower parathyroid that really doesn't look that different from the thyroid, but there's a little cleft of tissue there. And so when we took her in, I just opened up the neck again and I saw what I thought was the parathyroid again, gave just one cc of ICG now, and it lit up just beautifully. And we were able to take that out. And there's that confluence area of fluorescence that uh, tells me that it's a typical sort of parathyroid uh, adenoma and it glows in the dark on the back table. So uh, she did well and went home the same day, just fine. You're, you're um, telling us that, that you're giving one cc of ICG. So have you tried with lower doses or with yeah. higher doses? Well, uh, with, and, yeah. With the pinpoint, we used to give three cc's, um, but with the the, uh, the spy fi we 
I found it was three cc was, was too much. It's too, it's so sensitive that you just use one cc and that's all you need. You could probably try a half cc also. On the normal parathyroids, I, I like to give at least one cc. They seem to don't take up as ICG as well as the parathyroid adenomas, which sort of makes sense to me because the, they're not as you know, robust as an adenoma. We are trying now with 0 0.2 milliliters. Wow. Of, uh, yeah. yeah, ICG. And what we have seen is that the thyroid glands, you know, doesn't glow. Uh, and the parathyroid gland, uh, you know, take the, the ICG. So it's very interesting. My other question is, uh, have you tried to administer the ICG before the procedure and, and trying to see if the parathyroid glands keep uh, during the, the surgery, the ICG, and they like uh, stay glowing? I, I haven't tried that, but I did do a case, um, you know, I have checked the other side. So if I give a little ICG on one side and I didn't really see, and I need to go to the other side, maybe, you know, 20 minutes later, I can just use the SpyFi again without redosing, and the glands tend to still glow. But I haven't done it pre-op. Now, I know some surgeons, like the ones at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, they use a very high dose of ICG, and they administer it the day before surgery to localize other types of tumors like lung cancer and pancreas cancer. And it, it gets taken up by these malignant tumors as part of the enhanced permeability and retention effect. And so you, you have to give it a day before if you want to uh, have the tumors glow in the dark and you give a very high dose. So that's sort of an off-label type indication for ICG. But I've never tried it, uh, you know, in the pre-op area. But, and, and, and I like your idea about maybe doing a dose response for parathyroids. And we really should do that because maybe we don't need to even use a CC and we could reduce no, like We are trying 0 0.2 milliliters and what we are seeing is like the same as you are seeing is like they keep the ICG for a long period of time. So, and, and, and then the, the thyroid gland really clears the ICG, but you know, they stay. So, Great idea. Very, nice. Yeah. very nice, yeah. So uh, we presented our first uh, bit of data at the um, Academic Surgical Congress a couple of years ago, and it was published in surgery. And we used the scoring system from uh, Tripone in Switzerland, where he scores parathyroids based on the fluorescence of zero, one, and two. And most of the parathyroid adenomas were a category two, which is a very bright fluorescence. And the other thing about this study that we found was even if the Sestamibi was negative, which it was in a good portion of the cases, those glands still perfused very well. And so it was nice for Sestamibi negative parathyroids. And then more recently, we presented our, our, our case series of 66 patients with primary hyperparia using the SPIFI system at the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons meeting in April. And that paper is now under review at American Journal of Surgery. And what, the reason I did that study was I wanted to report on a different imaging system. And also, I was curious to know exactly how long it take, took for fluorescence. And so Jared Matson went back and reviewed all the films and everything. And what we, this is basically the most important slide was that we would give one cc of ICG and then we'd flush with 10 cc's of saline, have the anesthesiologist do it, and then we would set our time timer and the median time to initial fluorescence was only 26 seconds, so it was very rapid. And then the median time to maximal fluorescence was 38 seconds. So this is really something you can do intraoperatively that's very fast and it's sort of a dynamic thing that you know you really wanna watch for those first half a minute to a minute, because that's where you're going to get a lot of information about what's perfusing and what's not perfusing. And it really doesn't add that much time to the case, which is something that people always ask about. Um, so let's, that's all the good stuff, but there's definitely some limitations to the technology. So I'm just going to show you a short video of a, a false negative. Uh, this just to you know, be realistic about things. So here's, um, this, these are two examples of where there can be some problems. So this was a patient with a pretty large parathyroid adenoma. 
And, you know, we said, oh, this thing's going to glow in the dark, no problem. So we gave the ICG, and the only thing that lights up there is the thyroid. The parathyroid doesn't light up. And I'm, I'm going, what's the deal? Why is this thing not perfusing? And so we futzed around a little bit, and we moved the retractors. And after a while, we figured out that we were compressing the blood supply to that parathyroid adenoma, and nothing, none of the ICG was getting to it. So after we sort of uh, repositioned everything, then we went back in, and sure enough, it started glowing in the dark there, and you got a real nice perfusion pattern. So that's one of the potential pitfalls of, of using ICG to identify these parathyroids, is it? And then I'm, course, I'm here with this video, you know, it, 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 yeah. you know it, I have another question. So, yeah. uh, it, you know, for, for example, if I'm going to start using this technology, I have no experience in, in endocrine surgery using fluorescent guided surgery. So what is your recommendation to me that I, I, I bought the equipment? So what is my learning curve? Where should I, I start learning this? Well, it's good. You know, you can watch webinars like the one we're having today. Uh, there's a lot of interest in this. Um, I would stick to your basic principles, though, of parathyroid surgery. You need to know your anatomy. You need to know your embryology. You need to know where to look if you can't find them. You know, sometimes, I just did a case yesterday. The CT said it was on the right side. I looked on the right side. There was a normal gland. And then I, so I did a bilateral exploration and the other side, there was a little nodule on the, the inferior pole of the thyroid. And I said, that doesn't look quite right. And I said, let's just take that out. So I just shelled it out with the bovi and I sent it for frozen section and it was a one centimeter parathyroid adenoma. And, you know, I, I do that because I looked everywhere else and I couldn't find it. And sometimes you get these intrathyroidal parathyroid adenomas and so you need to look, or you need to pull the thymus up. Maybe it's in the, in the thymus or in the carotid sheath. So stick to your principles and, and do what's right, what you've trained, and then use it as an adjunct on easy cases so you get familiar with the protocol. Perfect, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, and oh, hey, this is perfect timing, Fernando. This is a, a case that you gave me the video of, and why don't you, Tell everybody what you're, what we're watching here, because this, well, this, yeah, this is a case of a of a patient with uh, stones, uh, kidney stones, and, and she came with a PTH that was elevated, calcium that was elevated. So uh, ultrasound was, you know, didn't find uh, the adenoma. So uh, we administrated in this case a 0.2 milliliters of ICG. Uh, we retracted the the thyroid gland. And here, what was really very interesting for us is that with that little dose of ICG, the vessel of the parathyroid, basically we follow the vessel. And as you can see there, uh, the parathyroid gland adenoma uh, start, started glowing uh, directly. So it was a really, uh, in this case at least, a, a fluorescent guided surgery because uh, it helped us to find the adenoma very easily. The other structures that, that were surrounding the adenoma didn't glow. Uh, and of course, you know, once you find the adenoma, it's, it's easy to dissect. But it, 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 it was our GPS in this case when the pre-op uh, studies didn't show us uh, the adenoma. So, um, and I believe, you know, we were discussing and, and if you look there, the, the normal parathyroid gland that was on the top of the, of the adenoma was not glowing. So the only thing that was glowing was the adenoma. This, uh, the, the equipment now, all of them has different uh, uh, software and then you can change the images as, as, as you show us uh, before. Uh, you can choose, you know, the black and white. Uh, uh, if you don't find something, they, I believe they show you better the, the fluorescence but you lose a little bit uh, the, the image of, of the anatomy, and then you, you can use the overlay images where you can see better the, the other structures uh, in the neck. Um, and this is, yeah, it was uh, our, uh, our case. And, and you know, what we are doing now is, uh, I mean, at least with the equipment we are using, uh, we have uh, different numbers that, that we are studying, and then you can evaluate 
uh, so far we evaluated, okay, I can see this glowing, this is glowing more than these structures. Now we are putting numbers to everything uh, yep. in order to, to evaluate, yeah. That was a pretty big parathyroid adenoma too. It looks like a couple centimeters at least. Yeah, huh? and it, it was hidden, you know, on the, on the pre -operative. We, we don't uh, ask for uh, the CT scan uh, mm -hmm. when the, the in, in this case the MIBI uh, was showing us the area so that's why we didn't ask for a CT scan if we don't find uh, the adenoma in the um, in the ultrasound or we don't find it in the um, in the MIBI then we ask for a CT scan and it, it was surprising uh, for us the low dose and the, how much it glowed yeah yeah okay good so yeah uh, I have some ch questions in the chat um, great topic and presentation. What is the dose and how long in advance do you fuse the ICG? Uh, we kind of answered that. We just use a low dose like one milligram, which is 2.5, or one cc, which is 2.5 milligrams. So the anesthesiologist will reconstitute that 10 milligrams of ICG, or 25 milligrams of ICG and 10 cc's of saline. So it, for each cc, it's two. 0.5 milligrams and we just use 2.5 milligrams and then we just infuse it real time and then Michael Redman asks are you going to cover autofluorescence yes I'm going to talk about that uh, next so let's let's go ahead and move on to the autofluorescence bit so really this comes into play with clinical applications in thyroid surgery and of course we want to avoid hypoparathyroidism that's a bad complication of thyroid surgery just like a nerve injury is bad bleeding is bad well, if you have a patient who gets hypoparathyroidism, you know, a lot of them get it temporarily and it can be very annoying. They get numbness and tingling in the lips or fingers, perioral paresthesias, cramping, irritability, the Schwastock sign, the Trousseau sign. Uh, here's the reason that it's a problem is these glands, normal glands are so small. And if you get a big cancer or a patient with Graves disease, where you're trying to save the parathyroids, they might get uh, devascularized and sometimes you'll take them out inadvertently. So, uh, in fact, we looked at the results from the nationwide inpatient sample and if you have hypoparathyroidism, your length of stay is twice as long as if you don't have it. So it turns out to be an expensive proposition also. This is, um, uh, parathyroid autofluorescence has become very popular these days, and there's two devices that have been approved by the FDA. One is the Fluobeam, and the other is the PTI. Uh, the Fluobeam is, I'll just talk about that because I, I've trialed it at our hospital, and I think Fernando has even a huge experience of it. I'll show you a little example of it in a minute. The, so it's a camera system that's handheld, sort of like the SpyFi, but it fluoresces at 785 nanometers, which seems to be the key wavelength for exciting the autofluorescence of the parathyroids. You know, we don't know why parathyroids autofluoresce. It's something inside them. But um, anyway, this device catches that and, and the glands light up. And the other one is called a PTI. It was developed by some investigators at Vanderbilt. And it's more like a, a pencil that you use in the operating room that gives you a digital feedback about when you get close to the parathyroid, also based on autofluorescence. You don't get an image with it. So uh, let's just look at a couple of videos of um, using the Fluobeam. And so the thyroid here, this, what you do is you, you get the Fluobeam out at the beginning. So here we still have the thyroid lobe in place and we've identified what we think is one parathyroid, a normal parathyroid, and you can just see how beautiful it autofluoresces there compared to the thyroid tissue. And that helps you guide your dissection during the thyroid lobectomy to make sure that you don't injure the blood supply to the gland and, and you, you know, don't take it out inadvertently. And then in this other window here, I've got, uh, see if I can get this to run. So this is that same gland, and then I found the upper gland as well on the left side, and they both autofluoresce quite nicely. Uh, the next slide here is after you've taken the lobe out, then you can go back in and have another look with autofluorescence, and then what you can do after you wanna, you want to make sure those glands are alive so you can give some ICG and they'll light up uh, with the ICG. 
The, the other benefit of autofluorescence, and maybe Fernando can talk about this, is that when you take a lobe out, you can go ahead and look at that on the back table before you send it off to pathology to make sure you haven't inadvertently take a parathyroid, a normal gland out, and you can reimplant it into the sternocleidomastoid. Yeah, for, for us, it has been really very useful tool because, you know, something that, that I believe we, it's important to clarify is like, they, usually this, the, this kind of equipment has both, both, as you mentioned before, you know, both technologies, the autofluorescence and also the ICG. So, yeah. and they're like a complement, you know, the autofluorescence, uh, we use it for, in order to identify the, 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 the location of the parathyroid glands, you know, where they are, and then the ICGs in order to evaluate the perfusion. So basically the information that uh, both, if, uh, you know, we can call them, you know, different technologies are, are giving us is, is different. So uh, that's why we use both. And when you, um, it turns out that, you don't want to give the ICG too early because you, once you're given the ICG, you can't do autofluorescence again during that case. Is that your experience too, Fernando? Well, we, we have a software and we change it. So the, it's, it's not that they have different wavelength, but the, it's like they are capturing different images. Yeah. So, and, and that's why, you know, when they take out, we, we take out the, it's, it, you know, we use the autofluorescence in different steps during the procedure. Uh, at the beginning, when we are ligating the uh, upper pole of the thyroid gland, and then, you know, after the retraction, and then as you mentioned before, once we take it out. Because for uh, us, uh, it's, it's really very important. Then if we have a hypocalcemia, but we have seen the, that the parathyroid glands are in place and they are well perfused, then, you know, uh, we are fine with that because we, we know that they are going to recover. Fernando, can you also, um, one other thing that you can use it for is if you're doing a central neck dissection for something like medullary thyroid cancer, where we have to do it, or PTC that has nodes, you, and you know your, your glands, your, especially your lower parathyroid glands are probably going to come out, you can have a look with that specimen and, and re-implant then if you find with autofluorescence. Yeah, we follow the dissection with autofluorescence, but we try to identify them. We have seen a, a, a false positive for autofluorescence. For us, this is not a problem. And this is a, a, you know, a learning curve that a surgeon has to experience using this kind of technology. Because when we see something that is glowing and we are not really sure um, you know, that this is a parathyroid glands, then uh, we uh, put a clip, you know, cut a piece of it. We have the pathology that is in the OR, and then they confirm if this is a parathyroid gland or not. If it is a parathyroid glands, we uh, protect it. If it is, uh, you know, for example, a metastasis of a, a papillary thyroid carcinoma, you know, that sometimes they may glow. Of course, we take it out. Or uh, sometimes it's something that is uh, that glows is when we burn with the or when we cut with the um, ultra scission, then you know that 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 tissue may glow. You know this is the experience, and right. and something for us that is also very important is when we perform the dissection and we take everything out, we check in the dissection if something is there as you mentioned, and then if we find something, same thing. You know the pathologists uh, check it and then we can reimplant it. Beautiful. Yeah. Awesome. So let me see. I've got just a little short video on uh, checking a normal parathyroid gland. So after, you know, we look at autofluorescence, we can also inject some ICG and make sure that's glowing in the dark. And um, sure, sure enough, this one is, you can see the nerve there. And as long as you have one parathyroid that is well perfused, uh, you don't even need to check calcium post-op, according to this randomized clinical trial of intraoperative parathyroid gland angiography with ICG predicts parathyroid function after thyroid surgery. So I think that the Swiss are very uh, much pioneers in this technology, Fred Trippinet in Geneva. And Mike, in your practice, for normal parathyroid glands, you use the same dose uh, as, you know, when you are trying to evaluate the abnormal parathyroid glands, so basically the adenomas, or you use different doses? Um, ICG, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. I think you, I tend to use a little bit more ICG for the normal parathyroids because it, they don't glow quite as much in my experience. And I use it after I've removed the thyroid, so you don't have that big 
a thyroid glowing in the dark there, you know, this is after you've removed it and you want to make sure they're approved for use. So I tend to use two or three cc's instead of just one cc. But, you know, you can see with your own system, you would want to just try it yourself and try different doses and see what works best in your own institution. My, and my other question here, when you are using autofluorescence with the equipment that you have, uh, what happened with the lights of, uh, of the OR? You, you oh, need yeah. to, like, yeah. No, it's a good question. With the, so with the ICG and the spy fi we don't need to turn the room lights off, but we do need to turn the spotlights. So if you have spotlights on your field, you won't be able, to, there's too much background. So you have to move the lights away. So that's one little headache. But with the, and with the fluo beam, I've been told, and I, again, I don't have as much experience as you do, that you need to turn the room lights down to really see things. So um, I don't know, do you have a comment on that? Do you have to turn the room lights totally off when you're using? Well, in, in order to use uh, autofluorescence, we, uh, we need to turn the, the lights off. And, and then it, 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 we, when using ICG, yeah. same thing like you do, you know, we, we just move them. You just move the OR lights, but yeah, with the auto fluorescence, a little more subtle. You want to turn the uh, the room lights off, and yeah. All right, so let's. Here's actually this is another video from Fernando that he sent me. This is interesting. I'll let you narrate this, Fernando. Okay, so yeah, this is a, a case of a patient that had a, a papillary thyroid carcinoma and. And with a metastasis in the in in the in the neck, so what we did was uh, a, a neck dissection, and what we uh, did here was we administrated one milliliter of ICG, uh, you know, between the, the um, in in the foot of the patient. So the idea here was uh, the ICG uh, to move through the the different lymph vessels, and then that was collected to the uh, thoracic duct. And what we were seeing there that was glowing was that this was the right side uh, of, the, of the neck. And we evaluated uh, the lymph vessels that were uh, uh, you know, going into the vein directly. And, and we know that if we injure this, um, the, the right lymphatic duct, then we may have a, a leak. And, and sometimes it's really very uh, difficult to evaluate or, or even to resolve because, the, as you know, the the wall of these ducts are really very, very thin. So you, you see that the, the lymph, uh, it's, it's coming out of the vessels, but sometimes it's very difficult to recognize where. Um, and when you put a stitch there or something, they're like so small that, they, that you, you, you can make another hole on these vessels. So to, to evaluate them is really very interesting. And, and the, the way you perform it, it's really very easy. Uh, you administrate it subcutaneously, and then, then, then you see it. Yeah, and if you've ever had a, a chyle leak after neck dissection, those can be really devastating for patients. Yeah. Uh, difficult to deal with. They can get malnutrition. They have to go on these medium chain triglycerides, which don't taste too good. Sometimes you have to make them NDO and put them on TPN, and then you can get wound problems and so forth. So definitely a complication we want to avoid, usually on the left side, right? Yeah, usually on the, on the left side, and he was on the right side, you know, and yeah, in, yeah, interesting. We know that in the left side, sometimes it's, it's uh, bigger and can be uh, more easy visualized. Sometimes you see it, sometimes not, but here was like, and, and the, interestingly here is that the, the duct is very small uh, and, and the equipment can detect it. So it was really very interesting. So um, that's great. So for the next um, next last 15 minutes that we have, maybe we could talk about adrenal uh, adrenalectomy a little bit, if folks are interested in. Um, and I'll just share a few cases. Of course, we know the adrenal gland anatomy, the cortex and the medulla, and uh, glomerulosa fasciculata reticularis uh, make different hormones. And depending on where the tumor arises, you can get a Kahn syndrome, a Cushing's, adrenal genital syndrome or a pheochromocytoma. And here's a, here's a lady who had uh, Cushing syndrome that came to see me, 27 year old female, and you can see her buffalo hump. And uh, she had a five centimeter mass in her uh, left adrenal gland. And so this is how we do set up uh, for adrenalectomy at UCSD. We usually use the side approach uh, with trocars underneath the left rib cage 
Uh, we flex the table and that seems to help. Uh, we'll mobilize the spleen, the stomach, the left colon off of the retroperitoneum, and then we'll identify the left adrenal gland with the blood supply. So here's uh, an example of us using some ICG to help define the anatomy. And you can see this lady's stria on her abdomen um, and her obesity. And here is her large tumor in the left adrenal gland that uh, was a cortisol excreting um, adrenal tumor. And you can give the ICG, you can see the small blood vessels, the uh, arteries that go into the adrenal tumor. And then you can see the left adrenal vein that is going to, in this case, drain into the left renal vein. And that helps you identify that structure so that you can get a clip on that. Uh, and interestingly, the, the tumor also takes some ICG up and the normal adrenal takes ICG up as well. So you really can do fluorescence guided surgery quite nicely with adrenals. This is an older video when I was using the pinpoint system and I wanna show, also show the Stryker 1688 because it really is, is beautiful. But the black and white mode, you can kind of go back and forth and get your clips on there. Uh, and that's what we're doing here with the adrenal vein. And what, what, what is the dose that you use here uh, of ICG and, and yeah, when do you administrate? Yeah. With the pinpoint, we use three cc's of ICG for all our adrenals. So, uh, and now same thing with the striker aim, three cc's or seven and a half milligrams of ICG. And we just give it right, you know, right when we're in the operating room. And then you can march along and you can take out the entire adrenal. The other thing that's kind of nice is you can make sure that the kidney is well perfused because God forbid you uh, ligated the renal artery and had a, you know, a vascular catastrophe with that kidney, which doesn't happen very often, but if you've got a large tumor, you wanna be careful about that. So uh, here's an example of a con syndrome. Uh, these are, you know, small tumors. This one was on the left side also. And here uh, is a, a video using, um, laparoscopic technique, and this is sort of how I do it. Um, I will put the patient again in the lateral position, and I'll divide the uh, attachments to the retroperitoneum to the pancreas and the spleen, and come along with a harmonic scalpel, and you get in a nice avascular plane. Uh, you, now, we've identified the left adrenal vein there, what we think is, and we're just dissecting that free. And um, if you get lost, you always want to, you can always find the kidney. And that's a nice way to make sure that you're in the right uh, area anyway. So here we are getting behind the adrenal vein on the left side, dissecting that out. And we're gonna give some ICG. There it is. You can see the anatomy very nicely go back and forth between the black and white mode. Um, and some of these devices now allow you to change the intensity of your fluorescence. So sometimes if there's, if there's too much green, you can cut back on that. Or if you need more uh, background highlighted, you can um, increase the background or lower the background depending on what the situation was. And this was, this cons tumor was actually a little stuck to the kidney for some reason. I don't know why, um, but. Yeah, and how, how long does the, the ICG stay in the, in the veins or in the vessels? In the vessels, um, it stays in the vessels for at least like five minutes and then it kind of fades away a little bit. Um, but we just use it kind of to initially define the anatomy and I'll show you what that looks like on the right side, which is real critical. So there we are, we, we've taken that out and uh, put it in a bag and you're finished. And let's see, here's another one. This is kind of neat. So here's, you can see on the CAT scan, the little normal adrenal, and here's this little tumor that's uh, causing Cushing's. And this one really glowed in the dark. So here, the tumor is very, very green in this little video, uh, which was quite nice because all the fat was 
was normal and you can make sure that you've really got, there's the kidney in the background lighting up. So we're just coming through some of those small attachments and we're making sure that we really use fluorescence guided surgery to get the entire tumor out. It's, it's uh, really amazing how the, the adrenal gland or the tumor uh, is glowing and the fat is not, no? Unbelievable. This is, <laughs> it was really <laughs> something else. And it's just uh, amazing how the technology has improved. And you see very little background. You're right. And, and what is impressive now is that you, we can operate now in, in this mode when you can see the fluorescence, you know, and, and the white light at the same time. And, you know, when we started, I remember that, you know, it was one or not the other one, right? You had to go back and forth and it was disorienting. And now you see, oh, hey, there's a little more adrenal tissue down at the bottom there. I want to get that out. You can do it real time. Uh, and, and let me ask, ask you something. In, in your experience, all the tumors are behaving this way or, you know, you have like tumors that don't glow or tumors that glow? Yeah, I think Aaron Berber looked at that at the Cleveland Clinic and um, some of the tumors glow better than the other ones. In my experience, the cortisol uh, secreting ones tend to light up quite nicely and the, the cons did. I don't know if the pheochromocytomas, maybe they don't take up the dye as much. But don't quote me on that. I'd have to go back to look at Aaron's paper because I think he, he saw a difference in the tumor type with uh, the amount of ICG. And it might just be very from patient to patient. Yeah. Um, so what, what I'm seeing now is that uh, the doses, and uh, we just, you know, everybody knows we're putting together now a chart uh, or, or with a different doses that we're going to upload in the society, in ASFGS. But now I believe the doses are going to start changing, you know, um, uh, depending on, on the equipment that we are using, right? Because uh, the, the, uh, now the equipments are more sensitive. Exactly, exactly. So let me just show, uh, I'll just do a couple more. I'll share this again. I wanted to show a right-sided one because I think the, the, the these two operations are very different, the right and the left adrenals. This is a 64-year-old female hospitalized for shortness of breath. CT scan showed a large right adrenal mass. It was greater than four centimeters. So we, we wanted to take that out. Again, I do um, a, sort of a retroperitoneal abdominal approach through the flank. I don't go through the back. I know some surgeons do go through the back. With the, the liver in the way, you have to retract the liver out of the way with a pad. But I thought that this video was kind of neat because you can see the vena cava. And with the right side, the first thing you want to do is really go for the right adrenal vein before you do the rest of the operation. It's opposite of the left side. The left side, you kind of dissect it all out and then you find the vein towards the end. But if you'll notice here on the black and white mode, you can really see and, and get a real good feeling for how much blood flow is flowing through that vena cava. Um, you can see it pulsating there, but we found the short little right adrenal vein and um, we're going to put some clips on that and come through it. One of my partners, Santiago Horgan, he just used the, the ligature to go through that vein, but it always makes me a little nervous. I, maybe I'm a nervous Nelly, but I put clips on it to put two clips on the side of the cava for sure. Uh, and then I feel like I can... Uh, sleep a little bit better at night. <laughs> and here I am putting the clips on. And of course, if you have a, a pheochromocytoma, once you get that vein clipped off, then the patient can have some hypotension. So you have to work with your anesthesiologist carefully to make sure that they uh, are ready to um, regulate the blood pressure. So there we are just kind of clipping that off and getting on with the operation. So we wrote up a little paper uh, in the Journal of Surgical Oncology, how we do it. And then finally, I'll just put a plug in here for the um, ISFGS website. The website address is isfgs.org. And uh, Alexandra and Electra have done a beautiful job of getting the website up and running. We've got uh, you know, a membership tab, education for patient, patient resources, physician resources, quality improvement. We've got uh, videos on the website and uh, we have links to the webinars as well. So it's, it's come a long way since we started it 
eight years ago or whatever it is, Fernando. I can't even remember now. Yeah. But <laughs> anyway, uh, it's growing. It's growing fast. I, I have a, a you know a, I, I have another question here uh, from France. Okay. Uh, from Barbara uh, Barbara uh, Selinger. She, she's oh, yeah. asking. Yeah. And uh, she says, uh, great presentation so far. Uh, would you, uh, when do you decide to auto-transplant instead of leaving the parathyroid gland in situ based on, uh, on lack of perfusion in parathyroid ICG and geography? Good question, Barbara, and it's nice to see you uh, attending. So what, what you can do and what some people do is if it doesn't perfuse after you give ICG, then you can make a little nick in the parathyroid and see if you get any bleeding. And if it's really dead, it won't bleed at all, then you probably ought to take it out and put it, you know, mince it up and put it in the sternocleidomastoid. I don't know what you think, Fernando, but. No, I'm, I'm, I agree with you. Yeah, we do the same thing. So my, my last question for you is, uh, what's, you know, in, 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 what, what you are seeing uh, is, what is the adoption curve of this technology? So what is the percentage of surgeons that are using this technology for, the different specialties in, in your uh, hospital or, or there in San Diego or in the U.S.? Yeah. Well, we, we use it for every lap coli uh, that we do at UCSD. We're, we're, and the residents are just getting used to it. They give the ICG in the pre-op area. They all know the protocol. Um, the nurses are getting used to it. So definitely there are colorectal surgeons use it for low anterior sections routinely now. I use it for parathyroids and adrenals. Um, the plastic surgeons are starting to use it for uh, all sorts of flaps, you know, uh, free flaps. And um, the breast surgeons are using it for sentinel node biopsy. And the, so are the melanoma surgeons instead of um, other dyes um, like methylene blue, for instance, it seems like it, it's brighter. Uh, the gastric surgeons are using it. I know for stomach cancer and sentinel node, and we use it also on esophagectomies to look at gastric conduit perfusion. You wanna, of course, avoid gastric conduit necrosis, which is a total disaster. So we use it quite frequently during our robotic esophagectomies that I do with Dr. Horgan. So I don't know, it seems like it's, it's here to stay and it's making surgery color-coded and a lot of fun, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't have more uh, questions. I, I believe we are on time. Any message that, that you want to uh, leave for the audience to, to give to them? I do see one more, I see one more uh, question in the chat uh, from Enrique Stupin Margain. He says, auto transplant and forearm or at SCM, I guess. Uh, well, that's a good question. If, you, if you're in the neck, the sternocleidomastoid is very easy. I think if you're doing an operation for secondary hyperparathyroidism, where you want to take all the glands out of the neck and never go back in the neck in patient with renal failure, I put it in the non-dominant forearm in the brachioradialis muscle, because sometimes you'll have to go back and debulk those, and it's a lot easier to do on the forearm. But that, that's my own practice. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so any, you know, final message for everyone? And I, and again, thank you very much. I, I, I really enjoyed talking with you. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Um, and thanks everybody for coming. Uh, we'll have more webinars and uh, hopefully as COVID starts fading away, we'll have our in-person meeting again, maybe in 2022, I guess, huh? Uh, more to come on that. So that'll We'll look forward to seeing everybody in person. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.